show. Quando quiserem, peoples. Vitor. Você sabe falar não? Não sei se o Rafa ou, ou, ou a Fefe querem dar uma. Ok, I can. I can... Fala uma palavra de maneira. Oi? <risos> Fala uma palavra de maneira. <risos> Sorry, guys. Uh, I don't know, Rafa, do you want to present Vitor? You were the one who had the idea, right? Yeah, no, sure. Uh, well, Vitor is a, a long time friend. We were, along with Miriam, we were all undergraduate people who suffered at the hands of our alma mater back in the early 2010s. And uh, I thought about inviting Vitor because I've always thought that his work, in a sense, resonated with, uh, with STP. And uh, I think there's a lot of discussions that he brings on that in turn in 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 connection to the to the problem of Im imagination, especially in the the colonial context of this issue, the political and uh, the political aspects of imagination, that I think really would highlight a lot of issues that we I think we tread close, but we don't deal with explicitly. We haven't done much discussion uh, in the group, in, in either in the context of, uh, not, not too much at least, racial aspects of political philosophy, po political experiments. We have uh, a, few, a few discussions that were brought by Michael, but more in the Atlas. Uh, but on the whole, and especially considering our recent foray into world systems theory uh, for the text that we did in the in the in the for the future publication on Zon Reto, I do think that uh, thinking through the issues of political experiments in the in the colonial, Uh, context, which is a, a large part of Vitor's more recent uh, project, I think it's something that could help a lot to see some dynamics that constitute the not only the the the, the status quo scenario of our current political situation, but also something that I think interests the group a, a lot, which is the idea of political experiments. So I think, in a sense, uh, his work is is a very good uh, guiding post for future research in in this direction, and I think uh, it's when I when I invited Vitor, I thought, well, this is because I've it happened to be a day where I read like you know he posted some an essay that he wrote on Sadia Hartman, uh, uh, and and then I read other stuff that he wrote in the in the same day. And then I thought, well, it's 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 something that I think would benefit a lot the group, uh, and I also hope that he 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 also enjoys uh, presenting these discussions here because there's a lot of affinities I think with the issues, and I think it will really help to 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 see things better in this in this issue. Uh, so that's why I I, I thought about inviting Vitor and I'm very happy that he accepted. I don't know if Fernando wants to compliment also. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that Vitor accepted our invitation. Uh, I think that uh, he's, re he's currently, his current research, his current research um, really uh, helps uh, to think about this uh, other spa time and spatiality that uh, race has. I think that it would help us think some other uh, stuff we've been working on. And I don't know, uh, yeah, I think Vito can start. <laughs> Okay, well, um, hello everyone, and I hope you're all fine. I'll, 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 
I would also like to thank uh, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Or I don't know if it's really night in some places, but here it's almost night. So. Uh, well, uh, I was talking to Rafael and he suggested me to, uh, when, when he invited me, he, we were talking about uh, this, this experience of um, an entanglement of times and temporalities that comes uh, along with uh, race, uh, the, with the experience of race. So I try to I prepare something uh, for you uh, focusing on this, um, and I I will be kind of slow today because um, I was uh, as I was saying earlier in Portuguese uh, I prepare something and. Only after three pages, I realized that, I, that I, <laughs> I was writing in Portuguese, not English. So I had to translate myself as a talk. Um, that's a, actually a good thing for me because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit tired because I worked all day. So I talk too fast when I'm, I'm tired. And so maybe this will help um, um, comprehension or whatever. Um, so uh, what I tried to do was um, at the same time speak a bit of my experience, my research, not in the sense of, oh, these are, these are the things I research, um, but in the sense of the how uh, I started with this back in 2019. Uh, how it started, at least in the sense of uh, a deliberate effort to go towards certain problems. And one of these problems was that of colonial inheritance and uh, of the relationship between inheritance and identity or identity formation. That, uh, that's what I began with um, back then. I was already reading a lot of stuff, but it didn't come to me as something that I that I could, you know, do something that would look like a, a research. And uh, the problem uh, of colonial inheritance uh, is also something that shows itself in the questions, in, in a question about uh, what is to be after the colony or what it is like to have anything to do with this thing that we call the post-colony. Um, and at the same time, uh, what it's like to be in the post-colony but receiving these uh, multiple and radically heter heterogeneous, uh, sorry, I forgot how to it. <laughs> this radically multiple uh, inheritance, as Derrida would say in the spectres of Marx. Heterogeneous. Uh, I think I got it right. I don't know. Uh, so we had this inheritance, something that comes uh, to us from uh, the colony, the time of the colony. And that's not only, uh, it's not only violence that comes uh, with this inheritance. But Anyway, uh, and one of the um, ways to enter into this series of problems was for me, uh, the reading of Fanon, uh, black skin, white masks, to be more specific. And also the reading of Achille Bimbe, whose works, um, and Bembe as, some, as someone who, in various ways, uh, brings Fanon back and takes something from Fanon, follow, follows his steps and repeats uh, Fanon, but uh, producing some sort of difference in this repetition. And, you know, I was really interested in all those gestures that 
uh, releasing uh, for certain uh, ways of reading a text, they really seem confusing uh, because we cannot tell uh, with any <clears throat> uh, exactness or precision uh, what is exactly Fanon and what is exactly Dembe, uh, who is talking and what's the difference between two. There, there are a lot of moments uh, like this in Dembe's uh, books and essays. And, you know, when I have to worry about this uh, whole thing about authorship and who actually thought of this idea or of this expression or this way of talking. And it gets very confusing, but at the same time, uh, it's kind of obvious that it's not really Fanon because it, it wouldn't make sense for it to be uh, Fanon because the time of the post-colony is not the time of the colony. So if you are trying to bring Fanon back to think about uh, contemporary issues, then uh, it cannot be the same Fanon. Uh, but at the same time, it, it actually is. That's really strange. But uh, in the sense what uh, I was interested in thinking um, something uh, like, well, how can you follow the steps of someone that lived uh, in a colony, fighting against colonization, and someone who is uh, somehow in, uh, situated in a before that according to uh, historical imagination that we're all familiar with, um, according to this linear progressive uh, historical imagination. Uh, it's a before that is in the past, something the has been overcome, you know. And the very fact of this overcoming is uh, something uh, that we have to be proud about. It's a fact to be celebrated, it's a fact of a distance between us and all those, uh, you know, figures from the past, uh, and we don't want to have anything uh, to do with those figures. We don't, uh, uh, even when we, uh, you know, uh, assume some kind of debt with them uh, because of their past actions, uh, but we, we don't want this to have anything to do with how we form our identities, with how we see ourselves. So it's very important uh, in general, that this uh, time, this before where we find Fanon, it's very important that it's really in the past. You know, if you're talking about Brazil, to give an um, example, uh, we, we won't talk about Portuguese people today as colonizers. Uh, even if you do, it's more like a metaphor or than anything else. Uh, if it's someone actually says with this uh, literal seriousness that they are actually colonizers, uh, this will certainly uh, make uh, people ask, well, what do you mean? Uh, you need to explain um, why are you talking like that? Because uh, it, what is to be explained is actually the reason for a uh, known acknowledgement of the difference between times, between the time of colonization or the time of slavery and, the, and our current time, the time of freedom, the time post abolition or whatever, the time of, of independence, if you're talking about an African context. Um, well, so, Going back to Fanon, he's uh, in this other time, and there is something uh, that separates us, separates us, and that goes uh, beyond an 
arbitrary market and calendars. Uh, he actually lives in a world that for us uh, is supposed to be left behind. We have to, this world has to be left behind because if, if you couldn't do it, then you couldn't go just following uh, in uh, you know a long march of progress or towards progress or you know. So we had to uh, acknowledge, like all the time, that uh, things are actually different, and it's a whole totality that uh, comes to us as something that has been overcome. The people uh, order, uh, the times order, the economies order and so on. So this uh, gives this give this gives us uh, an opportunity to have uh, other identities at our disposal. You know, colonizer and colonizer doesn't uh, work anymore. And of course, when we are talking about the post-colony and not about actual new colonies in the sense of, of what people call new colonialism. So uh, the question uh, for me was, what's the relevance of this excessive presence of Fanon in Bembe or of Fanon in the work of a lot of other people? And Bembe is just one um, case, um, the case that is more familiar to me. So uh, It's like Fanon becomes some sort of uh, unwilling prophet, someone who, uh, because he presented the terms of decolonization and this, these terms were not fulfilled, he can uh, come to us as someone who is announcing from the past that our present is supposed to be something else. As some, uh, he comes uh, as someone who is announcing a future that is not here yet and it has to be uh, a future to come because it just didn't so it's like he's always announcing the incomplete uh, character of decolonization uh, this very decolonization that uh, supposedly uh, had uh, put an end uh, to a time and gave birth uh, to another And this is like an, it's not a deliberate announcement because uh, what is deliberate and explicit about Fanon is his uh, revolutionary optimism, uh, which is not an utopian or utopic uh, optimism, but uh, just a, a way of saying, well, I'm here in this fight and what I've seen now, uh, it, there is is that there is something really happening here, really beginning. So uh, his optimism is more like, well, we are we already started decolonization. Uh, so let's just uh, keep it on. <clears throat> but if if you read this today, uh, his optimism uh, comes uh, more like a desperate call as. Um, you know, as someone telling us that we fail somehow and things cannot stay the way they are because there is still a work to do. The, the, the work of the colonization uh, isn't done, so there will still be a lot of to do. Uh, and so when I open, like, um, a text by Fanon, and this text still touches me, and it touches uh, a lot of other people in our time. This has little to do with the fact that he was like suffering racism, and that people now uh, suffer uh, racism too. Uh, or to be more precise, it's a lot more complicated than this, uh, because this touch uh, is more complex. Um, you know, there are a lot of things, uh, well, if we're talking about uh, black skin, white master, there's a lot of other things that actually touches 
uh, the, like the way he launch, launches himself uh, before our eyes in this spiral and spiraling fall that is the drama of identity. And this is also something that touches, touches us. The way he faces, uh, you know, if various tactics, this anguish of not being able able to say who he is. And um, he's not able to do this because on the one hand, he has to uh, acknowledge the fact that his self-declaration, his auto-declaration may very well be a hetero declaration. And that's because he's like improvising these movements, different movements uh, within the same game, uh, the same game board that is the colony, the world as colony. And on the other hand, uh, he doesn't have a, a way to uh, make sure that the force of this auto, but many times, and maybe most of the times, hetero declaration, uh, he, he cannot make sure it has uh, enough force uh, when he's uh, in front of the colonizer, uh, when he is uh, the object of the colonizer, the white colonizer gaze. In this case is the gaze of the world. So uh, it, 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 all, it all has this uh, cosmological scale that exceeds the problem of uh, suffering racism. Suffering it as a violent relation uh, between two individuals, no matter how we say that this relation has some sort of uh, structural support or origin or cause or whatever. And it's also this terrible scale that uh, we are touched with. Because, uh, you know, the, the way a, a whole world uh, seems like. Um, as if he it was organized against something, something uh, the phenomenon is something that we are, and something that is not uh, quite an individual, but uh, in phenomenon's eyes, uh, it was this radical openness fighting against uh, its objectification uh, as a non-human thing, but also fighting in the midst of uh, in the midst midst. Bleh? In the middle, I'm, I'm really bad to do those words. Fighting the middle of this objectification and taking uh, this objectification as an opaque starting point. Uh, <laughs> so and he's also uh, fighting as a radical openness and also fighting to become one to become more than this thing enclosed by way of racial significations so he can become uh, this openness that at the same time uh, he always was. But uh, Fanon's world uh, is another world, it's not ours. So, but at the same time we know, uh, because we know uh, the fact that his problems are the problems of a world, that requires some sort of uh, program of absolute disorder. And that's how he uh, calls decolonization. Uh, a program that will found society anew uh, in the same process of destitution of the very conditions of possibility of colonial violence and colonialism. Uh, the, this is also a process of abolition of since, you know, uh, it's it's about making colonialism uh, stop making sense. And you are also attacking its conditions of a possible legitimacy. And if the problems are posed in this way, we know that no matter how and no matter in which sense, they are also our problems because this phenomenon, the colonization, just never happened, even though it began to happen somehow and then well we know what will happen later so uh, 
the question of the identification when uh, in, in reading uh, Fanon's texts uh, is not really about, oh, he's a black man, I am a black man, we suffer uh, all those violences. It's more like you had to, uh, you know, feel uh, this weight of the, of the world that he is trying to, uh, you know, undo. He's trying to undo this world. It's not like trying to reform it or to change uh, places with the colonizer or something, you know, like that. And it all comes together with this identification with him as someone who is suffering uh, racism and colonial violence, but it is not only that. So uh, it's a text that, that is always like, uh, well, for me, it's, uh, it's touched, uh, has more to do with the way we feel uh, his desperation, his anguish, his, uh, his efforts to be something more than what he was supposed to be living in a colony. And this is not about, uh, again, uh, this is all about uh, things at a very cosmological scale. So when I read the uh, Fanon, uh, Fanon's text, I, I know that there is something there the or out there that allows him to come closer to me but i also know that i'm in somewhere else uh, in another time another reality another world and this is something that i know and not because i've been tricked by you no know, narratives of abolition as overcoming or of decolonization as the end of an era uh, because i'm um, taking a conspired illusion uh, as some sort of knowledge. I know this because I also have the experience in the very way I'm touched by Fanon's problems, uh, the experience of a distance. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's a long, longer or shorter distance, uh, it, it, it is there. Um, you know, uh, you can explain this in a lot of ways. I can, I could just say, well, uh, when I look around, I don't see the same things uh, the Fanon sees. I don't see colonizers, and he's always seen these colonizers everywhere because he's seen a foreign force that is clearly uh, different from like the local indigenous people. And for now, uh, this clarity is just not possible anymore. It's kind of too late to uh, you know, bring this back. And this clarity is actually very important for Fanon because that's what qualifies his uh, man man manichaeism. So I'm not saying the same word that he's seen, and there's uh, some things that are lacking and uh, just other stuff and there's new things that are here, but not there. And this uh, doesn't have a lot to do with some sort of rupture, but it's more about a reorganization. So uh, if the text is able to touch me, this touch, it, uh, if it opens a way uh, for Fanon uh, to come closer to us, it's also a touch that uh, from the beginning is uh, marked by a difference, some difference, some distance. And so he cannot uh, come to me uh, to the precise point where I am, uh, just like I cannot go uh, there and meet him exactly where he is. Is you have to meet along somewhere along the way. That's where uh, we can actually uh, give uh, ourselves to each other for this touch. <clears throat> and this has uh, all to do with race. 
know, not exactly with racism, uh, because if we now uh, follow Bimbe, uh, race is the condition of possibility for many things, including uh, racial violence. But uh, race is something that only exists be uh, because of the organization of a common sensibility that uh, by being radically insensible allows uh, someone to not perceive something and then perceive something else in its place. Like when someone sees a commodity in the place of a human being uh, with all um, you know his rights and things like that <laughs> or in the way people uh, if you like go into the colonial archives it's uh, this is everywhere people are always seeing something that is not uh, there but is also there because in some violent sense it's made to be there so uh, it, it's when people uh, talk about like even the geography of the African continent, uh, there is always uh, an, uh, some sort of delirious uh, fabulation uh, because if you're not seeing uh, humanity there, if you're not seeing a land uh, occupied by humans who have rights to this land, then you can see absolutely anything you want. So uh, this non-seeing and non-hearing and non-perceiving in general is the condition of, uh, you know, seeing something else uh, there. And race uh, is part of this because uh, you know, if you are seeing um, some something that is made of all those uh, racial significations, imaginary racial significations, uh, uh, then you are not really seeing what maybe uh, is right in front of you. But it's all more complicated than that because uh, it's, this is not about, oh, there are appearance, uh, appearances and there is reality or there are illusions or whatever, and there is the truth. So we had to replace uh, one uh, for the other and everything will be fine because colonization was also the work of making this uh, bizarre um, fabulations are real. You build a, a whole world with these fantasies. You build a whole world with these uh, things that you are creating because you feel free to create anything you want because we are, we are not, you are not dealing with uh, human beings in this. So uh, there is no actually no limit to what you can create uh, in your imagination and then create uh, using your imagination. So uh, the colony itself is like uh, <clears throat> this whole playground for uh, radically free imagination to uh, just go wherever. So uh, we have this uh, limitless imagination that can like fabricate all sort of uh, things about uh, those people who will be called black and will be called black by uh, not being uh, fully recognized as people. And we also have this uh, common sensibility that is also a common insensibility uh, because uh, you can only give this freedom to your imagination if you're not seeing, you're not hearing uh, a human being. So 
we have this, uh, what I usually call a colonial partition of the sensible, you know, following Hansier and the way Bende thinks on race in critique of black reason. And this partition, this colonial partition of the sensible is what survived the changing of times. If we today, if look, uh, <clears throat> We look, uh, we look to the past and see uh, slavery as something that has been overcome. And okay, we can do this at the same time. We act, we, we also uh, acknowledge how slavery left a lot of marks and effects and traces. Um, but if you do this, it's actually very hard to uh, you know where exactly. Uh, race fits in, because uh, if you don't do this, and if you think about race as something that uh, function and as some sort of transcendental, uh, trans transcendental authorization for slavery, uh, if race was uh, necessary, it was a, a necessary condition for, uh, you know something like a commodity appearing in where a person uh, should be. And if you think the race still exists, even if it's like this whole imaginary construction, uh, but if it, it, it's still, if it is, it is still here, then uh, how could it not be still able to work as this condition of possibility. So if you think uh, in this way, uh, what does it really mean to say that slavery has been overcome? Uh, because, you know, uh, if race has, is this that, have, that has this power to, uh, make a lot of things possible, including slavery, then uh, we had to uh, think about how it actually, actually uh, remains with this power, even today. And of course, slavery is something that leaves a lot of traces and marks uh, uh, in the body, in the, you know, in the psyche people in space in a former life and so on but racial vi racial uh, violence does not exist uh, today as an unfortunate residue of something that we uh, overcame and something that is now in the past because that's how uh, many people talk about racism as well we just well, the bigger problem was solved. We do not have slavery anymore. We do not. We don't have colonization anymore. Now we had this relative tranquility that comes with, you know, knowing that the war is over. So, but the thing is, uh, is not that it that it is over because slavery uh, was made possible by the same thing um, that makes uh, all sorts of racial violence today possible to. So it's more like slavery is an effect. That's not really the best word, but uh, you know, in the sense that uh, it's not cause of today's uh, effects in the form of racial violence. Uh, you no, know, we have we had slavery and we have this racial violence in the present because of the same thing. That is, race as a condition of possibility, and race as something that cannot be uh, fought apart from uh, this colonial partition of the sensible. So this means that what what was lived in the past slavery and what is lived now uh, both uh, points to a uh, point towards the same 
uh, bo bo both point uh, towards a sameness, a sameness that inhabits difference. And that's uh, the problem that we find when you, you know, study race and the colonial inheritance. Uh, most of the time, what you had to do is try to understand this sameness in difference. Which is, well, a very old philosophical problem. Uh, uh, but now I'm pretty sure Rafael is thinking about Plato. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's this really old philosophical problem, but now it's just more fucked up and more and, and darker. And, uh, maybe even harder to think about because what uh, the the whole thing is how do I know uh, exactly what is the same and what is different? What is different? Uh, and and maybe I don't actually need to know uh, exactly what is the same. Um, what is different, but I know there are uh, both things going on uh, there. Uh, and uh, I know there is something in the sense uh, uh, that has to make sense because it makes a lot of sense to many people who reflect about the lived experience of blackness or of being black in this world or of race. And it's uh, really uh, it's a mess because you know how can there be like narratives of people who after abolition saw the present as the same situation but only worse while other people were actually living uh, an unprecedented but long anticipated difference and other people and there are people uh, you know Today, still insisting that, uh, oh, oh, insisting in talking uh, about their experience as a strange way of returning to the plantation, to the slave quarters, or to the slave ship. But maybe, or, or maybe, is it not? It is not really a return, but. What is going on is that people were kind of acknowledging some sort of double presentification, like uh, being uh, somewhere by being somewhere else um, and actually not knowing anymore exactly where you are because of this uh, doubleness. And this uh, doubleness, it's uh, it, it's what makes the our feeling of um, you know a historical triumph uh, become some a sort of embarrassment. The sort of, the the kind of embarrassment you have when you hear a really bad joke. You know, oh okay, you're saying we are free now. Is this a joke? Many people would. Uh, think the way. And there is uh, a lot of reasons for people having these experiences and talking about like that, even when we are all the time reminded that things are actually different, that the past is in the past, that the worst, uh, the worst is over, that we have to be happy about uh, everything, we have to be happy about abolition, independence, um, whatever we have to be happy that we are not in the past anymore and that we are in another time but but that's not really the point because of course there are differences uh, that's really a non question because uh no one is so out of her mind to say, well, uh, absolutely everything is identical. Nothing really changed uh, in relation to the past. <clears throat> uh, 
Well, and people have all those different manners of talking about these weird experiences of kind of being back then and right now at the same time and this um, really messy um, sensation that the past is not in the past and the past is living somehow in the present or that the present is not uh, a rupture in relation to the past, but it's like the past with, with a new face or something like that. And <clears throat> what really uh, interests me is that, well, we have to navigate somehow through all this mess. And if there is something that we can take from Fanon, like an insight, it's not only the idea the decolonization is still something to be done, it's still something to happen in the future. Uh, <clears throat> what's, uh, there's something else that is really interesting there because the text, it touches me. And I know uh, because of this touch, because of this feel that uh, we share some sort of experience. And this experience, uh, it, it really doesn't, uh, care about all those differences that because I because I can meet Fanon uh, you know along the way uh, it means that we can live uh, for some time all the differences between the before and the now aside and talk about something else so it's an experience of uh, disturbing togetherness like some meeting in the distance and uh, you know if i'm talking about phenomenon that's only because it's one way of entering into these problems uh, of entering in this uh, meeting in this togetherness. I could start from the works of Saidiya Hartman or Grada Quilomba or Denise Ferreira da Silva, or, you know, I could start from uh, a conversation I had with a friend the other day, because the when and the where uh, do not really matter as long as it's a when and it's a where that we find in uh, this entanglement of times and worlds, a very diasporic uh, entanglement, <clears throat> where what actually matters is that it really doesn't matter how many people come to us uh, with all their good uh, intentions and tell about tell us about how the different differences between now and the past are so different and we have to be grateful for all of that because we know or we can always uh, know that there is a sameness about uh, which we still have uh, to talk so we have to find some way of talking about this sameness because it's really messy and it's really hard to think about uh, because it, it has to do with how, uh, you know, you feel things. It's not something that you can uh, know through some sort of sociological research or, you know, reading history books. Uh, it, it has to do with something that you feel when you know that this other person is feeling too. And... You know, you know that Fanon is feeling it, and you feel that he's feeling it, and, well, you cannot feel that you're feeling it because he's dead, but uh, maybe he is alone. Uh, so, <clears throat> this sameness uh, that brings people together makes us think about the reasons for these coming together and makes us think about how we all ended up uh, having to think about something that we have in common and we find this something in common in something we could call uh, a black uh, phenomenological archive and the experience of reading Fanon is the experience of finding something in common in this entanglement of times 
and the experience of finding that it's really common uh, to experience this entanglement, this confusion, this mess, even though Fanon, uh, you know, he didn't experience uh, any of this. And that's why uh, he has to meet us, not uh, staying exactly where he is, but um, uh, finding uh, us along the way and there where he finds us, uh, he finds us, uh, where we find him, there we also find uh, a lot of uh, people. And we find uh, ourselves in this entanglement uh, and from this entanglement we can overcome the very logic of overcoming and start to think about how this black uh, phenomenological archive is a source of reflection about something that is not quite what people are telling us. It's not quite what we are being told when you hear about the past, when you hear about the present, when you hear about history, about slavery, about racism in the present. And, um, but it is actually something we are kind of talking about with each other because we are talking about these strange experiences of feeling the the past is in the present and the present may very well be also in the past. <clears throat> like just the other day, a friend of mine, he uh, had this really violent discussion with uh, a white professor in you know in the university where he works and uh, the way he talked talked about these experiences was exactly as being back to uh, the plantation or being back to the slave quarters and plantations so uh, why are there so many people talking like that, talking as if uh, it makes a lot of sense to talk about something that has been overcome? Um, you know, what, what is the point of celebrating uh, this overcoming and celebrating abolition if you're going to keep talking about how you feel that you're just back there uh, in the present? So. You know, uh, and this comes uh, in a lot of different forms. The, the really important thing here is this feeling of uh, a time being inside the other, of, of time not working as it is supposed to work, of time not, not being linear as, you know, we were taught that it was of time not being progressive as people uh, you know, told us uh, that it was. So, <clears throat> when we start talking about these, uh, these experiences, we start to talk about what really matters because it doesn't really matter the fact that the present is uh, very different from the past. That is a fact. And as it happens with all the all other facts, uh, it doesn't matter because facts in themselves are not even something real. We just pretend that they are. Uh, and facts, facts in themselves, uh, in their realist appeal, they don't take us anywhere that really matters. So, because, well, according to facts, slavery is a, is a case closed. It, slavery be, belongs to this temporal closure and enclosure, and all we need to know is how to undo the effects of this past slavery. And that's not the same as thinking of slavery as something that only happened because of something else. And that something else is what remains. That something else is what we still find, find in these experiences of racial violence, and, you know, these experiences of a sameness, 
the name of the sameness, I would say, is the uh, this colonial organization or partition of the sensible, is the fact that uh, even though it's all different, when you are in certain situations, people can act to you as if there was no difference at all. They can just uh, kind of recreate uh, the scene or the, this colonial scene and start uh, acting as he would if he actually was living in the time of the colony. So <clears throat> what I really like to think about is about the, uh, you know, this uh, weird uh, sort of archive The well, it's not really an archive. Uh, it, it wouldn't be uh, recognized as such because <clears throat> it, do, it, it does not provide uh, the same uh, mathematical objectivity the historians look for when they look for the archives of slavery. You know, I want to know about all about the circulation of commodities. How many, uh, how many times? Where is going to? Where they came from? Uh, how many people died? Uh, statistics. All those. Uh, things uh, are offered as knowledge about the past, as, as knowledge about blackness in the past is actually just, uh, you know, uh, a, ma a mathematical knowledge, as Catherine McKittrick would say, of uh, non-being, of, you know, a knowledge of how black people were not actually people. So, uh, but if you want something different, if you need different sources, if you need uh, to go to different places, then uh, this requires us to leave certain method methods behind and certain you know, disciplinary boundaries behind, and it becomes a whole mess. Once again, because people tell you, well, you're actually not uh, doing historiography, so it doesn't really matter what I have to say. But the thing is, uh, it's not about uh, making it matter for those people. The thing is, we have to find ways of talking about what really matters. And that's what people talk so much today about, uh, on, you know, about the lived experience of blackness, or they are talking about intimacies, about uh, the daily life of black people, about all those things that are irrelevant for science or for whatever pertains to the science at this moment. Um, so this uh, phenomenal, this black phenomenological archive, this archive of the lived experience of blackness, uh, we can only treat it as if it was an archive, because that's a way of giving it an opportunity to uh, make it, uh, to make sense for us to become a serious object of research, even though a lot of people will say, well, that's not really a serious object of research. There's a non-object of research. There's a non-research and whatever. Um, <clears throat> and in this uh, strange archive, we all find uh, ourselves come from uh, different places, different times, uh, having different biographies. And uh, the fact is that the facts don't really make much difference. Uh, the pre precise details, details um, none of these actually makes any difference because the difference now is an opportunity to think about sameness. So, and that's not really bad. We, we don't have to approach this, approach this as, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing some kind of sameness, so that means that nothing will ever change. Uh, uh, 
well, one could think of, uh, about it this way, but it's kind of given up um, um, allowing this pair to make a home myself. Uh, we can think about this sameness as an invitation to think about the kind of changes that require our attention and that require attention to this cosmological scale and to this uh, non-linear temporality because well we need to leave the very idea of progress behind if you are actually trying to get somewhere and uh, that's what I had to say for today. I, I hope it was um, entertaining, um, interesting, um, or at least not confusing. <laughs> Thank you, Vita. It was awesome to hear you. It was really, really nice. Um, guys, do, does anyone have any question that wants to ask right away? Uh, I was going to propose because we generally uh, take a five minute break. All right. So would that be okay? Or that's how we usually do, but. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Ladies. Okay. Five minutes. See you. Okay. <laughs> five minutes, everyone. See you in a bit.
guys, did the five minutes passed? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... Ninguém estava contando. <risos> é. <risos> uh, eu estava, tanto que eu falei que eu tinha voltado. Ah, é? Tu falou? Eu não vi. Sorry. So, anyone has any question? No one wants to start. I can try if anyone. If no one has any question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we can read Fatima's comments also. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to read it, Gabriel? Or no, you can do it. Sure. I think yeah. also it's, it's did Fatima leave? Because if she, also if she wants to say add anything. Oh, she's here. Hey, Fatima. Uh, but I can read it if, if she wants to. Uh, so she said, thanks, Vito, for your presentation. Your talk made me think of the ongoing ethnic, ethnic cleansing in Palestine. Uh, while considering the difference, there is also this double that you cannot unsee in, in experiencing. And I think of theorizing uh, I, and, in, and thinking of theorizing about time. I went back quickly to a paper by Sami Kajib. You know, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Untitled um, on, on uh, The Time of Capital and the Messianic, Messianicity of Time, Marx with Benjamin. And here's the paragraph, last two sentences that caught me while listening to you talk about time, the rupture with the past, the reorganization, I still need to make sense of this, of all this law. So, uh, I'll read this later. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I to read the passage. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> me too. And it's actually very interesting because it finishes uh, talking about um, the categorical level of capital as the production of capitalism, capitalism's own historical time. And this uh, has a lot to do with uh, what I was talking because uh, the time, uh, the historical time that we um, experience in general and that we experience because it's the time we learned to experience is uh, the time of a temporality that has come with colonization. We, you know, we see time uh, as uh, colonizers who wanted us to see or feel or you know talk about it. and we have their ways of counting time we have their ways of making uh, history we have all of that and within this time uh, produced by colonialism we also have uh, whatever came after colonialism because we're still thinking in linear uh, terms, we're still thinking in progressive terms, we're still thinking in terms of uh, the present is better than the past and that going, or we're still thinking about the very possibility that there is a possible going back that is not progress. We, we do it all the time when you, I read the, newspapers and there's some you know, conservative policy being uh, voted and we can we call it a retrocess as if there is this going back in time and this going back in time is not doing progress uh, we can we can only go forward or we can or backward and uh, this is not. It, this makes uh, makes it really hard to think about colonization, about race, about the lived experience of race or of blackness, because uh, 
it is the experience of a confusing time or a confusing uh, temporality, this experience of an entanglement. Um, <clears throat> but it, but it, but that, but you also uh, mentioned Palestine, and there is also something going there in the sense of this doubleness because you say, well, we ended colonialism, um, well, but there is some new colonialism going uh, over there. And this newness is, uh, it's all about up upgrading or updating something that was very familiar uh, before. It's like, well, we have all this knowledge of how to fuck everything up or how to fuck people up and we're going to use it again. We're going to make a small changes uh, because, well, the times are older, but it's actually the same thing going over and over again. Uh, so it doesn't really make much sense to uh, talk about the past as we usually do, because uh, there's nothing really in the past. When, well, actually, there is still slavery, so, <laughs> you know, and there is still slavery in uh, countries, uh, what are now countries that used to have slavery, but then there was abolition, and then there is again Brazil, there is a lot of slavery in Brazil, but, and it's not really much different. Um, from the slavery of before in terms of the violence. It's not, it's just that it's not uh, this cosmological setting anymore. It's not a whole world built to uh, make, uh, make it possible for someone to be a slave, a slave and to make it possible for a lot of people to be slaves and for them to be moved around and displaced and made to work uh, somewhere else, like in the Americas, um, but it still have slavery. So all those things of the past are still out there, but they are not out there in this. It's, it's not really the same thing, but it's also not the difference. So. But when we talk about race uh, in uh, the Black diaspora, the Americas, uh, we had to deal with this fact that it's almost like some people are trying to say that nothing really has changed, but, it, but they cannot say this because they know it isn't true, but they are always almost saying this something that they know which is, that is not true, but uh, somehow they feel there's some sort of truth uh, in this. I mean, it's, it's a truth in, the, in this feeling, this feeling of sameness, in this feeling that can lead to desperation, but also can lead you to think about what really matters. So. Uh, the, the, and there is a lot of ways, uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, she talks about uh, the racial event as something that happens out of time and out of space. And she does uh, this, and it's a very strange way of saying, but she does this to avoid the logic of cause and effect. So, you know, uh, if uh, a black teenager's mother in London and another in Rio de Janeiro and another in Los Angeles, um, how do you explain this? These uh, things are happening uh, in different times, in different places, and in each time and in each place, uh, the explanations will most likely be, well, this person was killed because uh, she was black. So blackness uh, kind of you no know, kind of becomes an explanation, uh, a way of 
making sense about what happened. And Denise is, is thinking about something uh, structural, but also global, and how this global thing was um, was created uh, through res re racialization. So what uh, all those different uh, violent uh, happenings uh, in different times in different uh, places, uh, what they all have in common is that they like they reveal the same structure, like this the same event. It's only one event that happens again and again and again and in several different places, but it's like the same uh, event. So it's a way of talking about sameness. And her way of talking about it is. Uh, well, we had to get rid of our categories of time and space so uh, we can think more clearly. Um, there's also Hartman that has a very interesting way. Uh, in Scenes of Subjection, she will show us how uh, abolition and, and the time of freedom was a reorganization of the time of slavery in the sense that uh, you don't really have much structural changes after uh, the emancipation. And uh, what happened is, well, you free uh, a lot of people and now we want them to work because, well, slave, uh, slaves built a whole country, uh, this whole reality, this whole world, and the machines uh, is still need some uh, one or someone to operate it. So uh, you, you cannot just free people and then allow them to do what whatever they want. They have to come back and work. And they had to come back and work uh, for the same people sometimes, a lot of times. Um, but now this person was not really your owner. It's why you were, he was your boss. Um, the way, uh, and this applies to Brazil uh, too, the way uh, people uh, found to make people work was to create this whole ethics of um, paid labor. You have to behave uh, like this, and there are behaviors that are inappropriate, and we will criminalize them, we'll make laws like you can just walk around the city without having some kind of proof that, that you are a worker. So and if you don't have any document that proves it, you can be arrested, and you have this serial cr criminalizations of uh, a lot of movements, a lot of different movements to, were just like people trying to live their lives without, had, without having to uh, be forced into a system that they had nothing to do with it. What, well, uh, people were brought uh, from another continent and now they're here and their descendants have to work uh, you know, like for a salary, and what's this? It, it doesn't really make sense. So people had to make this make sense, and it was a, a really violent um, operation because people had to be, uh, you know, put under constant surveillance, and people had to be uh, forced to do. Uh, to live, uh, to inhabit the cities in one way and not another, because uh, if they just live uh, however they wanted, uh, then this will become uh, some sort of nonsensical crime, and they will be arrested, and they will be beaten, and all the uh, all this surveillance, all this. Uh, watching closely people to see how they behave, to see how they uh, live their daily lives. This was really the same thing that uh, 
happened before, but now the, the, the difference, uh, the only difference was that people maybe could, could be paid for the work they were doing. But, uh, and then we have all those people who just run away. All those fugitive people who uh, left this world behind and many of these people we don't even have to uh, have a way of knowing where they went or what, what those people were doing. I don't know, maybe just being free, living something that was not imposed uh, by uh, educators, by police, by uh, lawmakers, by everyone, this multidisciplinary effort to, you know, force people into a system of work that didn't re that did not really make sense the sense has had to be uh, made and violently so what hartman uh, is trying to do is show how the time of emancipation of freedom uh, is just the time of slavery but uh, a bit different you know, there are a lot of things to remain so it made we it made all the sense in the world for people to look at this new situation and don't really see much difference from the past even though they knew it was different because they now were called free people free people with all the responsibilities of the individual liberal subject and so on but they, they were not slaves anymore so you have to acknowledge the difference, but uh, this difference was never enough. I, I think that's the whole uh, question. Why do people do not think the difference is enough? Why do they think about the same, the sameness, and are not satisfied with the differences? And this is a, a question that you know can be asked in a lot of other situations, not only um in this post colonies I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Someone <laughs> another question. Uh okay, so I'll 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 just comment a few things that I think was very interesting. First I would like to thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. It was very it was excellent uh to have a, a, a global view of this problem introduced, you introduced it from a very small, uh, you know, from a, a, it's, it was very interesting how you, how you were able to connect the thread starting from like a, a simple issue that you found and then you reconnect it to the problems of global racial domination under capitalism. So it's it, it it was fantastic to see how much you 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 were able to connect those threads. What I would like to 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 to, to say and to ask is because I think one of the most interesting points that I think at least for me uh, really appeared and it's something I think that I commented with you briefly when I when I invited you is that uh, I think this issue that something remains at the point that something was already something it, it it already had to end uh yet still something remains and this puts the problem of the the space time continue is put i think uh in question in the sense that well this this is not there is no progress if progress means something that is quite the contrary to the general effect of political experiments, especially the successful ones. I think what really appeared, and this is something that I think appeared in this meeting for me, uh, and I think also because I had the text in mind, so I think it really grew, is because in a sense, it's like quite the contrary of what we tend to expect, which is, well, you have a political issue, you have a certain group which is an inexistent, in a sense, you know, it, uh, they don't appear in the social sphere. Uh, the, the, the reason why they don't appear in the social sphere 
does not appear also. So slavery is naturalized and there are a whole lot of, of, of elements that construct this uh, colonial uh, sensible partition as you, as you, as you put. But the funny thing is that after you emancipate, it's as if something which is at the same time that it's brought to light, it is also put down under the rug again, but in a more uh, grueling sense, you know, it really, it's really interesting, I think, and it reminds me, and, and I think it, it connects a lot of, uh, a lot with the, the issues in the group that we've been discussing, because first, because there's this thing that, well, uh, it really puts a, a, a really, it really explains the sense in which going back to political experiments is useful. It's useful in the sense that, well, you can have a struggle, you can have a form of emancipation, uh, but when you get back, and maybe there's this delay, there's this stagger, when you get back, you you have like this a strange sense where things are a bit weird because aren't we supposed to be decolonial, post-colonial? And yet these relations are even more invisible. They are even more vague. And, and I, I find it really interesting because uh, one of the things that that I that I think is is interesting in the in the framework that we've been trying to develop here in the group is the fact that well a certain social uh, infrastructure or a, a social structure it is a it's it's not a, a something that is a, a homo explained by a homo by a single principle it's something that it needs to be uh, explained you will see like a entangling of different modes of of exchange it's the karatani stuff that you've heard us talk about endlessly in many opportunities but uh what i thought that it reminded me is that well for one it is very clear that there's this uh untangling of the relation the relation of this of, of slavery and capitalism there's like we we are we all know that this is very worked in a lot of literature how how racial capitalism is completely racialized how it depends upon on racial race racial and slavery uh to 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 further itself but i think what really stood out for me how the untying of this knot which is you have like a, a, a an institution that is it's the racial the the slavery and uh, it's like a, there's a notion of property which connects to the element of race which is also another kind of dynamics that might be closer to uh the the differences we find in anthropology between different ethnic groups which is a different kind of social relations and then we have all these tied these relations tied up so that people can work more or whatever and they can be explored and and this is invisibilized but what you bring and it also you were talking about the the hartman uh i think it was hartman where like you are freed and then you have to work for the people you you were it reminded me of a very candid passage in Machado de Assis and for people who are who are not uh, who are not from Brazil, there's only been it's it's very recent the idea that Machado de Assis is a black writer. Uh, this is something you know. There's a lot of whitening of who he was along the 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 last century, and all the the issues on slavery and racial exchanges in his books have only been treated with this in mind very recently but there's this novel which is my favorite novel of his which is the the memories of iris memorial de iris uh, and there's a point there's like this possible love between younger young kids and one of the kids is like a, a woman who was an orphan i think her parents died so she inherited the farm 
and the farm had had slaves slave workers uh but the the it's a moment where the slavery is in the path to ending to being extinguished as a legal entity so machado says like you know how it's how she she describes it it's it's very you know all those layers of irony but the she, she they describe the slaves as wanting to the as wanting the 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 woman who's the inheritance to continue being their masters even after slavery ends so there's there's this whole uh dimension i think which you know enacts this transition and i what i what i got me thinking is like i i think your your insight is very interesting because you know there's there's a different entangling of the structuring of the social sphere in a sense that there is a discontinuity because slavery as a property is undone we, we we you know that's been solved but at the same time the continuity uh, tells us of like you know this this was an issue not only because of the property but because there was another type of underlying social structure that was not treated and which in a sense is even more hidden now that we don't have the property so i don't know i'm just like you know rambling but this is was really you know because i think it's a it's something that it's like the what if of the revol you know what happens after the revolution or what happens after the struggle and the emancipation and then it's like well we get more more we get more fucked up as always <laughs> yeah yeah you know it even reminded me of that passage in capital where marx says which i i always forget but he says like you know uh after the end of at the end of uh i don't know i don't remember if he's talking about slavery or about serfdom but it's like you are crowned he says we are after slavery or serfdom people are crowned with this horrible horrible opportunity to be uh proletarian workers you know uh and then he leaves it like in a sense that it's not that it's it's he, he you know nobody nobody would say it's worst but there's all there's this lingering aspect that remains and i think specifically in in the in the issues you raised is also tying out with the the recovery of the political experiments i think it really you know it was really incredible for me to to be able to see in broader light this fact that well the political experimentation has a side effect an unwanted side effect that something in existence is produced in this process which is also the lingering effect of what was not treated in the previous situation you know i think i mean maybe that's but man it, it was incredible thank you thank you again for for coming to talk to us today well there's there's a lot of things um um I think I think Hartman in Sins of Subjection is also mentioned in Marx. I don't know, uh, there's uh, this passage where she talks about how people now that they were free were free to sell their freedom. I don't know, something like that. Because that's what it really meant. Well, you are free and now you are free to do as we tell you we are free to work in the jobs we had for you we're not free to choose your job because well you're not gonna be um you know uh, an entrepreneur a president you're not gonna be the owner of anything we're gonna work for the owners again but this time maybe you get a salary because what actually happened was that people uh, for a long time were not paid because slave owners, and this is something uh, that was very common uh, here in Brazil, uh, slave owners felt there was some kind of debt because they only saw those people as property. So uh, abolition meant uh, a general loss of properties. So people want uh, something like, um, 
you know, insurance money. Uh, people want to be paid somehow by uh, uh, for what they lost. And there was a lot of contracts that uh, treated these people who are now free as somehow uh, from the beginning in debt. And they had to pay their debts by working for free. So not everyone was actually paid. And that's something that has a lot to do with how Denise Ferreira Silva talks about the unpayable debt. Because uh, abolition begins with a debt that cannot be paid. Because you owe, and this is not only financial, it's a moral debt. Because uh, you know these slave owners, they will look at you and say, well, we did you a favor. No, you you are only free because we wanted you, you to be. So uh, it's a beginning that's already loaded with a lot of stuff that uh, kind of make the past uh, really present because uh, it's not really going away uh, in the sense that people don't want it to go away. Um, they had to, these slave, ex-slave owners had to acknowledge a difference. They had to you know, follow the new laws or they uh, had to write contracts, but uh, they are not really uh, wanting to let it all go. So it's, there's a general anxiety in a lot of places, that's not only about the USA, there's a general anxiety that comes down in the end to this worrying about who is going to do the work that we need to, uh, we need to be done. Because I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to clean my toilets or whatever. Someone has to have this job and well, there are a lot of people out there who just became free, and let's give the, the, the all those jobs to them. And but there is also the experience of an opportunity to uh, experiment with uh, a lot of stuff. If you read like Angela Davis' work on blues, and she talks about uh, all these women. Um, <clears throat> who wrote and performed songs about uh, sexual experimentation, sexual freedom. Uh, this sexual freedom uh, was something perceived as new, as something, you know, well, uh, here is a difference from before, because uh, before the sexuality of the enslaved woman uh, had to be integrated in this whole machine. Uh, and it was not supposed to be uh, experimented with. So uh, you have in the history of blues, uh, all those women uh, talking about this common uh, experience of being able to finally do some stuff uh, in the sense of exploring uh, their sexuality and maybe even doing things the men were supposed to do. I like to travel a lot and you know, live this nomadic life. And, and so uh, there is this experience of sometimes something that's even worse from before. There is the experience of, well, something is new and we have to do something about it. And there is also, there is also a lot of... Uh, political uh, experimentation in the sense of asking what if I don't really have to do any of those things because they don't really make any sense? What if I'm, what if I don't become a worker? Not in the sense that I'm not going to work or that I'm refusing to work for someone to have a boss, but in the sense that I don't want to embody the figure of the worker that is being uh, 
constructed and violently imposed uh, upon people. So uh, the, the figure of malandrage in, in Rio de Janeiro, it's all about that. It's a, well, well, maybe I will work, maybe I won't, but the most important thing is that I will not uh, give up on experimenting and exploring new new ways of living or even old ways of living that I make new uh, because I'm in a different situation, in a different context. We're not in Africa anymore, for example. So a lot of things uh, will happen in the sense the, uh, of experimentation, improvisation. Like I like how Fred Morton and Stefano Hane talk about this, like this, uh, like everything is like just a big jam session where you, you know, do all this crazy jazz stuff and just go on improvising. And, uh, and you actually care about the improviser. You're not trying to uh, reach a specific place. You just want to uh, verify uh, the possibilities of your body, this very old question that comes, uh, you know, Deleuze made it more alive, but it's coming from Spinoza and actually it comes from before. I, I, I don't really know what the body is capable of. And the history of Black diaspora is also the history, it's not only the history of some sort of violence, it's also the history of constantly uh, doing something just to see what the body can do. Even in the uh, plantation, there's uh, you have these uh, weird uh, cases of people who, after work, oh, my computer is doing these weird, weird noises. Uh, but you have these people who, at night, they gather and they already work on the plantation and they start to just do all sorts of crazy movements that doesn't and, and this doesn't make any sense because well you are tired and you have to go back to work tomorrow uh, to in the plantation so why would you spend your night uh, the time of resting doing crazy movements uh, and um, it, may, it actually makes sense if you think it was some sort of experimentation because you uh, work in there as a slave and this means that your body became some sort of tool and that has its proper and improper uses. So you were out, people were always trying to see what else they could do. Right? what else was possible beyond what colonialism uh, imposed to them. And this has, uh, it's a whole issue of uh, experiments with mobility. Like, I want to know how I can move uh, in ways that are not uh, anticipated and prescribed and imposed by uh, colonialism. So you have movements in the sense of uh, you know, spatial movement, uh, experiments with the body, or just a ex existential, existential movement, like possibilities of existing. And people were always trying to like find something new. So, uh, and of course, after abolition, uh, we can you can do a lot of more improvisation, a lot more experimenting, exploring, and that's just one of these things that you had to acknowledge is, well, this is different uh, from uh, before. Um, and just one last thing, I, I, I was, for some reason, uh, I, I was thinking about Plato again, because uh, well, you, you talk about space uh, and time, and uh, I think the, the, the it's all about uh, finding a way to think outside of time and space. And that doesn't have to mean uh, 
not think uh, not thinking about space at all or not thinking about time at all but we have these concepts uh, we are familiar with these categories these ways of seeing hearing and feeling and so on and those are the things that have to be put aside for a moment so we can uh, think about this experience of sameness because uh, what this experience teaches us is that uh, there's something really fucked up about the idea of progress, of, about the idea that we can just go forward and look at the past. Well, look, these people were horrible. They did slavery, they did colonialism, they did all this creepy stuff. And we don't really want to be like them. And we, we, we know that we're not like them because we know there, that there is a difference in time. There is a difference in maybe even space so we have also this his this whole history in brazil of all sorts of denialism like there's a point that people will start talking about uh, slavery as if it was something uh, embraced by uh, black people oh no they like to be slaves they look like uh, how they are happy and and then there is uh, sometimes people start talking about as if there is even uh, racism in Brazil. There is also something to be denied. And this has a lot to do with race because race is all about not seeing what you do not want to see, not hearing what you do not want to hear. And this uh, comes to us in several forms. When I hear uh, music by Black people and Instead of hearing music, I hear noise, senseless noise, animal noise. Uh, you know how people uh, talk about basically every form of black music since forever. We will talk about this, uh, about funk. And this is not really music. This is something else. You do not want to hear it. You don't, do not want to hear the musicality of it. You do not want to hear the poetry of it. You don't want to have anything to do with this because the things with you value, uh, you cannot see them there because you do not want to see them there because if you did, then would, this would, would simply mean that there is no difference uh, uh, that's significant enough to be uh, maintained in you know, whatever ways. And race is the ultimate weapon and tool to uh, produce difference, but not only to produce difference, but to produce difference by not seeing and not hearing what you don't want to have anything um, to, I don't want to have anything uh, to do with this. So I would just create something else. Uh, no, uh, I don't want to talk to these African people. I, I will just create something else, and I'll hear and see what this creation has to, uh, you know, say, and, and show me, and so on. So, uh, thinking about the sameness is a way of thinking about how race is all about this not seeing what you do not want to see because if you think about a race uh, and sameness you have to think about what what is it that we have in common with the time of slavery if, if you think about race as something that made slavery possible and you think that race is something that made a lot of other stuff possible today, then it's just the same thing back then and right now and in the future. I was only talking about past and present, but there is also the future in this entanglement because you, you can experience the future as this uh, eternal repetition of uh, not of the present, but of the past. Like we never left the uh, slave ship, the hold of this the ship, or something like that. So uh, it's all about uh, thinking about what is not really nice to see or nice to 
reflect on because uh, it it all means that we have much bigger and complex, more complex issues than what we have to. Because people are uh, really happy about going around and saying, ah, I don't like racism. I disapprove of racism. I think racism is wrong. And so what? Do, do you even know what you're talking about? And most people actually do not think like they do. They just think, oh, this violent thing that happens, uh, people have these false conceptions in their heads about who black people is, and we we'll just have to enlighten them. And they stop doing this, and everything will be fine. But And then we go back to Fanon and the way he is just bringing a whole world with him and presenting this world as a scene where he's trapped and he's really fighting uh, to be free of this world. And not only free from the colonizers because, well, you can always become the colonizer. That's why it's so important for Fanon in like the wretched of the earth to uh, say, uh, several times we do not want to become Europeans. We are actually trying to do what they never really were able to do. That is bring about this human as a radical openness. Um, you know, as if he was always uh, saying how, uh, you know, this French existentialist uh, thought of nice things, but the French people uh, weren't able to actually do something about it. And then Fanon is all, is all the time saying, we are going to do something with this. We are to go in, we are going to bring this human that we, we love to talk about. And, but doing this requires uh, what it calls a program of absolute disorder. It's all about disordering time and place and city and the fields and, you know, the whole world so you can leave them not as a black person who is free, but as a person who is free from blackness. That's his whole aim of this. And we understand that this is the question of, for him because if you think about uh, race as something that allows for a lot of violence, is slavery being only one of them, then we have to think as, uh, of race as something that has to end along with a world, along with a time, along with a space. And that's the whole point of uh, Fanon. And I, do, I don't want to be black. I don't, I don't want to, uh, you know, make glad, feel, make black feel good, make black feel pretty. I can do this, and it will, will be really nice for some time. But then uh, some colonizers will just uh, come to my face and say these horrible things. And what am I going to do with this? I don't know. Black is beauty. Long live the empire of Egypt, ancient Egypt. I, all of these dissolves in the presence of uh, this colonial gaze that is the gaze of the very world as a colony. So you have to be free of race, free from race. That, that's his whole point. I, have, I want to have the right to not be uh, black. There's talking too much. Right? <laughs> no, but it's... it's, it's... It's nice to hear. It's awesome, actually. I'm really, really glad you came here. <laughs> uh, a lot of things. Okay, but I I wanted to go back to this uh, time. Uh, this uh, I don't think it's time. It's, it is a little time and space, but like uh, I was thinking, trying to. I don't know if this is like. Uh, productive, I don't know if it's a good way to uh, to to try to glue together two authors, but uh, as you were talking about 
how Denise Denise Ferreira tries to uh, talk about race, not as cause and consequence, but as something that is, and there's something that is global and there is uh, appears not in the explanation of different events. This reminded me of Badiou, because in Badiou we have the situation and the event, but specifically that it, it seemed to me that in Badiou truths, uh, in the truth that comes from the event is something positive. I don't know if this I'm I'm right, but as I was reading it, it felt like always the truth is something that carries uh, this innovation, and this is this could be a positive thing, like an, an openness to something that is going to be better than before. I don't know, maybe people here that are that union can say something about that later. But, uh, and I was thinking like the, the that race seems to be uh, this truth, this colonial truth that uh, keeps leaving its marks and keeps making uh, these effects, and I don't know. I, I, it, 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 it's hard to. I don't know. It's made th that this. I don't know. I think that it's it's hard to really. Uh, place race in this system, of but you like where where this this because it doesn't seem like only a two, of capitalism. As you were talking about, it it really appears that it's it's something more, and that is in this ontological the hand. Like uh, I don't know if that made sense, but and and I think it's that is it's a, a way that uh, this feels visible is that we try to uh, when we. I think that your concept of partilha colonial sensível e agora como é que é em inglês? This sorry. Colonial partition of the sensible. Yeah, colonial part par... that 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 you said. <laughs> But this is a really good concept because I think that this uh, grabs this uh, nature of race that doesn't it, it doesn't um it doesn't oh my god what's the word it doesn't fit well when you say that race is only a tool like it's something it's something more it's something that is it's 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 a little more it feels i don't know i'm only thinking that there is a um something that it in the in race that feels like a a truth And that's horrible because I, we wouldn't want that, but that's how it works, apparently. I don't know. That's my comment, but thank you that you came here, Vito. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know shit about Badiou, but uh, there's, uh, but you were right. Uh, race as a tool is just one way of talking about race as a tool, as a weapon. We can also talk about as a condition of possibility. We can talk about as a, an imaginary construction. We can talk about it as a mask. We can talk about it well, as a mask that becomes the face people. Uh, I think the only uh, really bad way of talking about race is talking as if we're still talking about race as something that has something to do with people's bodies. And um, there's a lot of ways of saying this uh, without really saying with all the words, because when you just go on talking about race as if, as if it's something that will never go away, 
as if it's, it's something that you have to make positive and then keep this positive and with you and carry it around. Uh, it seems like race is actually something that belongs as a quality, an essential quality of a body. And that's really just going back to, you know, uh, colonial discourse. Uh, it's, it's not really that different. If, if race doesn't seem like something that can actually be gone, then we're just talking about the same thing as uh, the Europeans did back then. Uh, well, at least I think so. So uh, race can be many things, and that's why it's so hard to think about it. Or maybe uh, by thinking about it in many ways, we are making it be many things. Um, making it be many things for us, uh, you know, for our thoughts and or something like that. But uh, I think that what's really important is not to mistake race uh, for a mere illusion or a mere appearance, false appearance or something like that. Because it's actually very, very real for people who experience it. It's like experiencing who I am. That's nothing that's more real than this, uh, experience, uh, this experience of my own identity. Which means that uh, the things that feel most real uh, for us are, well, usually imaginary. So there's no point in trying to oppose imaginary and real to say, well, uh, people have had all these false beliefs and we are going to correct these beliefs and well, problem solved. So uh, so I, I think, yeah, race can be uh, read as some kind of truth that emerges from uh, changing your perspective. I'm, we start thinking about it like this, and I will open myself to another possibilities and let some kind of truth manifest itself. I don't know. Uh, but again, I, I have no idea what, what is going on with all those. Uh, but you, <laughs> but you um, uh, I know Denise doesn't like Badu. <laughs> the, the, the same text. I was really She's <laughs> talking about Badu and <laughs> saying this. It's, it's, it's just most <laughs> like all the racist. So <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. I, I really did not, uh, don't, don't, I, I do not know uh, much uh, except for those things I hear in conversations with you or read in Twitter. Um, I don't I, I don't think <laughs> that I actually read a book of, of by Baju besides some parts of his recreation of the Republic. <laughs> so, you should read it. Uh, we are here, we are but, uh, I, I think that I get what you're saying that there is some horrible truth that is to be uh, like found or we have to make it appear and i don't know because the truth will, will set us free I, well maybe that's <laughs> way of, of way of talking about it i try not to think about truth and false things yes much. i know that is not in your <laughs> Really, uh, it, it really makes it harder to think about things like imaginary, imagination, because then there are too much confusion. So uh, in general, I just, well, let's pretend that, there, that it doesn't really matter what is true or what is false. Let's see what appear, what appears as truth or as falseness. Uh, for people, because it's just more useful to think like that when you think about race, because race, again, is all about uh, not seeing what we call uh, the truth and seeing something else that we would 
normally call uh, you know something false and, or some illusion but things are a lot more complicated than that because and uh, Ashil Bimbe's critic of black reason uh, I think it's like the nicest way of putting these complications uh, but it's yeah it's really hard to talk about it but because it in, in the end, it's just this thing that someone imagined and made real by violence. So what is... Yeah, but the, that's, the, that's the thing of the truth in Bajiu. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> but just, just this, I'm just going to uh, make this real quick point, because then Gabriel can go. Sorry, Gabriel. <laughs> but... Uh, like the truth in Baju, you said, oh, this is, uh, it's hard to talk about in these terms, true or false, because it's something that someone imagined and through violence, it became real and it is still real. And so in Baju, truth is something that is made and that the subject is not like a, a single person that goes there and say this and that, etc. So I, what I was thinking is like, it, 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 and this phrase that you just said seems to make this more visible. It's really bizarre that uh, thinking race as truth in this sense, because it's something that um, was incorporated and lives through through that for Baju like uh we uh I, I don't I, he gives this in, his, in this example in the beginning of the second manifesto uh when he's talking about some tragedy something something like that that he said that there's a truth there that lives up to today I don't I don't remember the example exactly but in this uh, sense I was, Sorry? I think now I, I get right. Yeah, so now it's like, oh, but it's uh, what I was, so it's kind of horrible because it, it, it is a, it's a bad truth. And I, I never, uh, as I was, as I'm trying <laughs> to do my master, I never th thought about uh, a bad truth. And this was the first time that I, it occurred to me, oh my God, so maybe uh, race, is something that the colonial subject carries and but we are already in this post-colonial subject so this is up to debate also but i don't know we i think we should talk about talk more about this maybe you could read but you <laughs> but you can <laughs> it makes a lot of sense now uh, it's like this truth the colonial subject uh, carries uh, with its, with itself uh, even uh, to the point where he's it the, you know, uh, is not anymore a colonial subject, but a, but a post-colonial subject. It's something that you can carry through times, and and by carrying it through different times, you just make time itself a problem because uh, it's like race uh, carries with it some of the time of colonization. So if you just keep carrying it and handing it over and making more of it and even making experiments with it, uh, you're just uh, carrying around something that brings uh, a whole other world with it a whole other time and um, maybe that's a way of talking about this entanglement of times and spaces uh, it's actually makes sense well you said uh well you mentioned you mentioned uh tragedy that but tragedy is uh, it's presented with horrible truths <laughs> it's not really fun truths uh, and that's it it's like a horrible but yet very beautiful truth I think I like to think of, of these things as, you know, Gleason or Fred Morton, 
where people who refuse to uh, see only the terror in this whole thing, because when you think about this diasporic subject, uh, it begins with nothing but um, beyond what is violently imposed, a new land, a new way of living, a new language, a new everything. And whatever you do is taking this new thing and making it something else. So uh, you have to see beauty in horror or beauty in terror or beauty in violence. And Glissan does this by using very ambiguous words in his poems, like you're, you're reading the poem and then there's this word and you know that it's a horrible word, but he presents with this word with a lot of ways of making it aesthetically positive. And it's really confusing because you're like, well, you're trying to tell me that this horrible thing is actually beautiful. And it's just like Fred Martin talks about uh, the narrative of Frederick Douglass about slavery in his autobiography. He talks about the noises of his auntie Hester that was being uh, beaten violently by the slave owner. And he says, well, these sounds, they are what awaken, awakening you to the truth of slavery. And you know, because you're reading his autobiography, that uh, hearing this sound like a form of knowledge is connected to the fact that he uh, got away, that he became uh, eventually a fugitive, and eventually he came back to uh, work for abolition. So uh, Fred Motin will say, well, this is just uh, our beautiful, uh, horrible music. We, we, we will not get only bad things from it. We'll take whatever we want and we'll take whatever we need because that's what we've been doing uh, since the beginning in the Americas. People give us stuff violently and just make something uh, with it so maybe uh, there is this terrible truth that is also beautiful because uh, i don't know <laughs> uh Matt, can i just ask a last thing has to do with what fernanda asked first of all man it was really 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 good uh, I just wanted to, since we're, it's already getting late, and I, I just wanted to make sure, not really make sure, but just try something, see if it makes sense, uh, also as a way to summarize some of the stuff you presented. Let me just, as usual, let me just share the screen. I'm really sorry. <laughs> just... It's like the STP baptism. Yeah, I, I was writing down as you were speaking. <laughs> sorry. So you're, but, you're being baptized right now. Just to say that this is a ritual moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize. This is so ridiculous. But just because no, I no. want to make sure I understand some things. And I think that what Fernanda asked also helps me ask you a couple of questions. So this is just what I was writing down from you. And, and you can tell me, do the, the Marshall McLuhan thing and say, no, this is totally wrong. Is, is, uh, that, is that in, the, <laughs> in the, the normal figma? Yeah, yeah. So what, what I wanted to say, is because I think it helps also with the question that Fernanda asked, and which I think it would be nice to be able to separate these two things, like, uh, a, 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 you know, an abstraction that exists throughout time doesn't need to be a truth to exist in, in any but you sense. So, but I wanted to just to see if it makes sense, because I, I, I you, you, you give me this intuition, which is, Let's say we start with this first definition, which I think it's really, really good, and I wonder if it makes sense to to frame it this way, which is to say, well, race is, you need to start thinking of it as a condition of possibility, and this partition of the sensible is almost like a redoubling. You have a double that will be there, and it defines what counts as socially existing, 
and throws into invisibility, inaudibility, uh, everything that doesn't propagate this particular construct that is the, the basis of the partition of the sensible, right? And then the, the first thing I wanted to compare in, in a bit is that then you said, well, the first thing you get is a little machine because the things that make difference here, they will localize, they will tell us the meaning of the things that don't make social difference, right? So uh, the, the social place that the that race places on populations will determine what will be the noise and what we will substitute the noise with. We will invent fabulations, fantasies to cover it up, right? Yeah. And and what you the, the thing that I think it's really nice to put this little bar between exist what exists and what doesn't exist. And it's not that it's not there. It's just not given visibility, audibility, intelligibility, and so on. Is that then we can define Two ways that progress happens, and I think it's, you described them really nicely, which is we progressed because something that was inexistent now exists, but the partition of the sensible is the same. So, for example, something that was inexistent now is visible as precarious wage work. Nobody can explain why it's precarious because the partition of the visible is the same, so you cannot talk about the history of why the conditions are the conditions, right? Or you can have a different type of progressive, which is you remove existence and throw people only into inexistence. So you, you eliminate one of the two sides of things. And for example, you make invisible that slavery still exists. You, you, you can pretend as if it's not there. So it's right. almost two processes based on the same codification or the same partition. You either invent progress because something that was below the bar is meant to not exist and it's only what's above what exists so if what exists is wage labor is the market the best that can happen is that or you say ah you don't want that so there is nothing we're gonna remove the social existence altogether and then everything disappears and it's even greater invisibility because it's not even socially effective. You cannot go to the market, even though there are slaves, and say, hey, how about buying slaves? So it's still there, but it's not effective in the, socially effective in the same way, right? And then it seemed to me that you proposed an idea of an archive that is totally inside of this. It can only go back to find, you know, these facts, this conjunction to say, hey, look at how people were indexed socially in this way, and only do that or to confirm the fantasies that were there. But we can't do much more. It's either fact or fantasy and mixtures of those two things, right? And the, the, the first question that I had is that it seemed to me that when you try to reconstruct this through political experiments and the history of these things, it looks like this arrow here is inverted because it's not social existence that is determining the invisible. It's something that is socially invisible that is determining what was visible, right? So what didn't exist socially, music, improvisation, malandragem, uh, all the things that you need to stitch together alive, they are the ones that have the, that give, throw a light on what was going on, right? And it seems to me that this is different because rather than having a fantasy about noise, fantasy on top of, what you don't see, you get to imagine things on top of what exists. So you don't get trapped on, okay, this was the particular project that was going on at that time with those people, they managed to do this. But you get an, a surplus on top of it because it could be more than that. It could be something that's still gonna repeat, right? And the, the, the thing that got me thinking is that I think it's the first time I heard anyone very silently oppose progress to something which is like a you know like i wrote it very small here but it's kind of in between the lines of everything you said right but it's very very tiny here because the effect seems to be that well if you this very intimate experience of something which didn't have social effectivity so it can only be experience it cannot be theory a concept pure pure let's say factual, but only shared through facts. It needs to have some intimate dimension. And I think you repeated that often. 
uh, then it gets connected with this togetherness that is not just there. It can actually appear in many, many times, right? It's outside of time and space. So my two questions for you uh, are, what about, is, is, is this a word you're, you're ready to use? Okay, <laughs> I see the head. <laughs> and the second is, uh, perhaps it is interesting to have, I'm not sure how to do it. I, I wrote it differently because, of, because I was embarrassed of writing with the same word because it seemed to imply too much. That non-existence as the thing that is drowned as noise made unintelligible and a political experiment that is not treated as part of the world, not socially effective. I wrote it as in existence just to distinguish these two things, right? Because they seem to be different. Like the, the non-being that is attached to blackness, for example, for Fanon and so on, uh, is different from the non-existence of something that is being done but it's not public or not shared or is has to be hidden, has to be in between the lines, right? It is, this thing here is very productive and it, it has like an indifference to its own context almost. It can be recuperated. It, it has the power to help us see the, the world in a different light. Whereas this non-existent is like a box. You can throw fantasy on top of it, right? So right. the two questions I had were, what about this little word? And what about the difference between these two things here? Like, what what could we? Yeah, so, so just small stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I I like the words you chose because they avoid uh, truth and you no know, appearance and falseness and and because that's. One thing, uh, I, I could talk about uh, colonization as somehow hiding the true self of a person and you know, covering uh, this person with fantasies. But the fact is that when you wear these fantasies, they become your skin. And so you're not anymore whatever you were before. And I think this is uh, very important because it means a lot to me uh, if, when I think about uh, this diasporic constitution of subjects, the idea that you cannot return, that there is nowhere actually to return to. So, uh, yeah. Uh, about eternity, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, very appropriate. I, I I wouldn't say it, but uh, I don't know if I did it. It would sound a little silly, maybe, but uh, it's like really going into this no space and no time where everything comes together uh, because you open up a, a, a book and. Uh, something there touch you in a way that pulls you out of whatever and whenever you are, but you're not going exactly to another specific somewhere or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of can, if you think about eternity as being out of time, then okay. And it also works with if you think that eternity is just another temporality. So uh, I think uh, it, it captures uh, very well the idea of being a time out of time. And there is also this very strange thing about God, the Christian God, that is his always doing stuff, being outside of time and space, but he just goes around doing stuff uh, all the time. So um, that's obviously not happening because he doesn't have a body. He doesn't, <laughs> <it's not there. laughs> but at the same time, you can only imagine as just a person walking around, giving orders, creating stuff, uh, exploding something giving gifts uh, throwing his son to this hell we call the world and 
I think it's kind of like the same because you are out of time and out of space and you're still in doing you're doing a lot of stuff there. You 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 are in this togetherness where your experience uh, starts making sense beyond your space and time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and of course, then you're gonna ask why uh, is this happening? What what do I have to do with this guy Fanon who was fighting against colonization in Africa? It's not even a thing you do anymore. So, uh, but in a sense, he he has this excessive presence, and I, I choose to talk about Bembe because it's very clear that Fanon is everywhere, but it cannot be everywhere because he's not a citizen of the post colony but you know it's all maybe paradoxical or whatever but it's there it's everywhere it's not there we are there we are not there so talking about eternity or i don't know something uh, similar but to talk about space uh, i think it really makes uh, a lot of sense because is, is this experience of time uh, not mattering that much? Like being like God, like what is time to a God? Well, what is a yesterday? What is the progress to God? What is uh, the fact that things were actually different before? Uh, what is no abolition and freedom to God. None of these things actually matter. So uh, maybe you can learn something from him in this sense. <laughs> uh, because it's all about making other things matter. You know, I, I, I don't, it's like when Césaire uh, says, well, you talk to me about uh, roads that are being built. You talk to me about uh, all those things, magnificent uh, signs of progress. And I, I talk to you about the people who are uh, being destroyed so that progress is uh, possible. And it's not that he, he, he's denying that those things are like, oh, of course, these things are nice. Maybe he doesn't think they are nice. Uh, the, uh, the fact is that it doesn't matter because he's trying to talk about something else. And maybe the history of Black people in the diaspora is always trying to talk about something else, but then you had to, you were always hitting this, this wall that is the partition of the sense. Mm -hmm. and, and you want to, that's why people are all the time talking about wanting to talk, talking about want to uh, be seen. And of course, sometimes this is a trap because you want to be seen uh, into this social existence that is not uh, really uh, made for you to be happy. So uh, you can also think about fugitives and you know, uh, maroon societies, people that are just like, I'm out of it. I'm out. I don't want to have anything to do this with this. And we're not going to see me anymore because I'm going to disappear into another world that I'm building with my friends in this friendship that uh, was made possible by violence itself. So, uh, you know, and when uh, about uh, non-existence and in-existence, I think it's nice that in-existence is also... If yeah, true. The parade is like in uh, existence. And there is uh, really a difference because uh, uh, when uh, you are defined as a non person, a non citizen, a non subject, a non whatever, a non human being, uh, that doesn't mean that you are any of these things, just that. The world is trying really hard to make you be some of these things because if it fails, it cannot keep going on. So uh, there are a lot of known, 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 knowns that are being uh, perceived because uh, what 
what you are not uh, seeing is the humanity of, uh, and of course you can, you don't need to think about this humanity in the sense of the humanist that is being criticized by Fanon and many others, because he's thinking about humanity as something open, as something that the Europeans wouldn't be able to do, because as I say, wherever you find this human, you talk about so much, you try to kill it. So, uh, there is this thing that is being denied, and this denial is the condition for uh, participating in this world. You are only welcome if you are a non-human uh, and do whatever we want you to do. But when, uh, and this is the history you get when you look at the colonial archives. And that's actually the whole point of my research because it's the history of violence. What, uh, if you take these documents, juridical, uh, uh, commercial, administrative, uh, you know, police documents, they uh, are going to present to, uh, present black people as commodity, they're going to present black people as a non-human being, they're going to present black people as a problem to be solved. You know, while uh, the slave owner goes to the judge and he's asking for help because these black people cannot stop making noises and playing their drums or they doing this horrible noise and they need help. So when you see the document, what you see registered there is a problem. And the same thing, most of the uh, archives of slavery are documents about how commodities were going around. You know, you don't have, uh, you have like properties, uh, a shopping list and a black person is a property, is something to be sold and bought to be owned and you don't have the names of this pe this uh, of this person and don't have anything you have only what it matters for it to be uh evaluated as uh, a property so that's most of what you find in these documents so the whole idea of talking about this black phenomenological archive there cannot be an archive because the archives we have because whatever comes to comes to us as archives are those documents of known uh, social existence or of social death so uh, the document where you're going to find black social life is this document of the maybe uh, unarchivable or I don't know if this, if this is the word, of what it cannot be archived. It's lived experience. It's something, uh, you know, you know it's there, but you cannot prove it, not in a way that would satisfy, uh, you know, certain people who do not want to hear and do not want to see anyways. So if you look at, uh, to black history in the Americas as the history of people who are doing something else other than being objects and victims and known stuff. If you try to uh, create or, or see or hear a history of living uh, people, a history of life, a history of social, black social life, you're gonna see these, uh, that it's, it doesn't really make sense to keep talking about uh, them as known existence. They are existing in, the, is existing in these strange forms, in these unintelligible forms, uh, in these improvisatory forms, and they are just fine. There is nothing wrong with them. They are just uh, doing stuff. And, you know, uh, you can find uh, nowadays there are like uh, books or photographies, there are uh, black archives, and you just keep seeing photographs of people doing just whatever. You don't see people being bitten by the police. It's just 
uh, a guy in his garden uh, looking at nowhere. You know? uh, just people leaving because you want to show that uh, this is also blackness, this is also being black. And I think in existence works very well because uh, it doesn't really make sense to use existence in the same way because uh, you're fighting against this way of existing, against this way of defining existence. So you are in between something, in between existence, uh, in an existence that is yet to be more recognized, but you are, you are already recognizing it. You have your friends there and uh, that's community and that's a social force for whatever you think of as a another way of existence because I cannot think this by myself. Oh, I I being black now means to me um, well fuck me it doesn't really matter I just leave my house and um, the policeman will not really agree with my new definition of being black. So you uh, you know every resignification needs. Uh, sociality mm -hmm. and there is this black sociality going on everywhere and the whole uh, issue is why we are not seen as we could and should or why we are not hearing its music you know so uh, I think uh, I think the, this whole thing you draw there uh, makes uh, a, a lot of things. Um, actually, I would like a, a copy. Of it. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Just to, uh, I, I don't know, I think you help me remember this conversation. Um, I keep thinking about those things. And yes, eternity. It's all about eternity. Yeah, that, 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 that one was, I mean, it's honestly, I mean, I know it's late now and it probably, I know Fatima is still here. It's like, three in the morning there and Monica is also very late but uh, I, I just wanted to say this because definitely I mean for many many reasons I think that we, we should all talk more together because uh, there is such a strong debate today about sort of critique of progressiveness but any new idea about what relationship to time historical time is established instead of that is it's there's almost no debate it's just the critique itself. So the idea that there is a, an alternative, more positive way of approaching this, and again, recuperating something that is so, <laughs> you know, such a such a lost word in in whatever way that because it's also very singular this type of alternative, which is more about availability because you can recuperate doesn't mean it will impose itself, right? If you don't do it, if you don't read it, if you're not involved if you're not it, yourself putting yourself in a certain process it's not gonna take you by your ear and so force it. it together because uh, how else are you gonna know the it's a common experience mm -hmm. exactly it's perfect yeah so it's a, it's a weird way of thinking eternity rather than the via necessity it's eternity more via you know it's available I mean, if you if you do something, it, it you're gonna touch on it. If you don't, you're not. But it's you can't avoid it being available. It's a, it's a w interesting way of thinking. Which was uh, in a sense colonization, uh, making people available for uh, you know improvement of the world, and it's all about uh, neoliberalism and whatever you may call it, uh, making people available all the time. Now it had to be. 24 hours a day may be available to uh, make progress, to improve, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. improvement. So it's also a way of, well, what if we start paying attention to other uh, ways of being available that we cannot actually avoid, we are already. So whatever you do with this, you cannot escape it. You can pretend it's not there, but you are already available by the very pretending it's not 
there. Because if you are pretending, it means uh, something touch you, touch you somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Infinity of internity of eternity with fatality even see the possible form of infinity. <laughs> Simple question. Like <laughs> it's too late, but is infinity of eternity? <laughs> I have no idea. I think that's the short answer. <laughs> but there is some difference, right? Like there is definitely a difference between something which is always happening eternity because it's always happening and something which is eternal because you could you could reach and touch it at any time it's it's different yeah. I, i'd say i don't know how to how to it's always uh, just like yeah. again uh, that's a nice example you can talk to god anytime exactly perfect you yeah. can also talk to your ancestor or to your friends you know Uh, but there's also uh, uh, a thing about finity uh, or finity uh, because it's always about transgression. There, is a, there are limits imposed and those limits are about everything you can imagine. There are limits to how you live, limits to what you imagine, limits to whatever. And... You cannot just embrace the fact that you're finite or finite, finite. Uh, that you're not an infinite being. You have to uh, not be satisfied with, with, with what is given. So it's always about opening possibilities everywhere and whenever you can. But I think this uh, op as these possibilities are more about uh, changing uh, our categories, changing our criteria, changing our words, changing stuff all the time, making new sense of things so, uh, until we can finally stop uh, doing this and everything you know, will be something else. But I don't know about the infinite part. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I love that uh, it was easier <laughs> to say not infinite than finite. It's a much better way of saying things. <laughs> We're definitely amongst you. <laughs> uh, So guys, I think we 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 call it a day then. Yeah, I think we can call it a day. And man, yeah. just want to thank you again for coming. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, and I mean, you you just like you know did your magic, <laughs> and and then simply we're back in eternity. So I I, I really <laughs> hope that uh, back to where we've always been. Uh, I, I I hope this is not uh, the only time. I hope there are other times you can come back and, and talk with us because it's been an incredible pleasure. And now you've been baptized by by Gabriel's. I'm I'm too much. That that's the baptism. Baptism by drawing. <laughs> it was actually very uh, you know. It was not really an, one of these aggressive stuff that he usually makes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually very nice and <laughs> simple and thoughtful at the same time. So, I really appreciate it. And uh, I really enjoy uh, you know, talking to you guys. I hope I can come back many times. I hope my platonic friends are happy with eternity and sameness. <laughs> well, Rafael invited me, so I had to give something back in this platonic 
post-colonial Plato. <laughs> so... <Yeah. laughs> like one of the thousand Platos. Now we have another one for the list. A thousand and one Platos. <laughs> Amazing, guys. Uh, oh, I just just wanted to ask because I don't I don't remember if we mentioned this in the beginning. Just if you because we normally post this in the YouTube. So if you want, okay, it's, we can post it. And... YouTube is uh, full of me saying nonsense all <laughs> night. Like, right. Sleepy and tired and just talking. <laughs> <laughs> this is just one more. It doesn't make one more. <laughs> no harm. No, okay. but seriously, no, uh, it's fine. Uh, I don't really mind. I just hope uh, more people find me. Yeah, okay. That's great. So, hey guys. Okay. So, thank you guys. Thank you, Vitor. It was Obrigadão, awesome. Vitor. Foi muito maneiro, cara. Foi demais. Foi demais. Volte sempre. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.